In this video we'll look at relative atomic mass and how it's calculated, the operation of the mass spectrometer and some calculations relating to calculating relative atomic mass. We know that atoms of an element often consist of several different isotopes and these vary in the number of neutrons that they have in their nucleus and hence their mass number is different. Each one of these isotopes has a mass which we refer to as the relative isotopic mass. We use the word relative because it's relative to carbon-12 which is taken as 12 atomic mass units exactly. Relative isotopic masses of elements can be obtained using an instrument called a mass spectrometer. This separates the individual isotopes in a sample of the element and determines the mass of each isotope relative to the carbon-12 isotope and it also measures the relative abundance of the isotopes. This information is presented graphically and is called a mass spectrum. The sample to be tested is vaporized and placed inside the ionization chamber. Here an electric field removes electrons from the sample creating positively charged particles. These positively charged particles are then accelerated by an electric field and pass into the field of an electromagnet. The electromagnet acts on the charged particles causing their movement to be deflected. By manipulating the electromagnet we can arrange for a charged particle to pass right through the machine and be collected by the detector at the end. The signal could be amplified and the number of ions with that particular charge can be recorded. This is what you would see if you wanted to get a mass spectrum of chlorine. In the mass spectrum it shows the isotopes of the element. The number of peaks indicates the number of isotopes, in this case two. The position of each peak on the horizontal axis indicates the relative isotopic mass and the relative heights of the peak correspond to the relative abundance of the isotopes. For chlorine, one peak is approximately three times the height of the other, so the isotopes are present in the ratio of three is to one. Similarly, this spectrum is the spectrum of mercury. There are far more isotopes here. We've got five, maybe six, seven isotopes in this case. And the height of the peaks can be used to work out how abundant the isotopes are. So in this case, the isotope with a mass number of 202 is obviously the most abundant. We can use the isotopic masses to calculate the atomic mass of an element. Remembering that because there are more than one isotope for many elements, we need to create a weighted average. In all these problems, it's best if you take a note of what information we're given to start with by underlining it. So in this case, if we're looking at the boron isotopes, we have an abundance given for mass number, a mass of 10.013. We have 80% abundance for mass 11.009. Now to calculate the relative atomic mass, we use a formula where we take the abundance and we multiply it by the isotopic mass, add that to the abundance of the second isotope and multiply that by the atomic mass and divide it by 100. And if we work the calculations out here, keeping all those figures, we end up with an answer of 10.810796. Now all those extra figures at the end aren't particularly relevant because the least accurate figure we had to start with only had two decimal places. So when we take into account significant figures, we can round that down to 10.810796. In a similar way, we can find the atomic mass of silicon using the data given. Again, we're given abundances and isotopic masses. So we can use the same formula as we did last time, multiplying the abundance by the iso relative isotopic mass, adding them all together, and we end up with an answer of 28.1. This problem is a little bit different, but works in a very similar way. In this case, we're given the relative atomic mass and the isotopic masses and asked to calculate the abundance for each of the isotopes. The formula we used before is written in the yellow box below. So let's just check the information that we have. 6.94 is our relative atomic mass, so we can place that in our equation. We're given the isotopic masses for each of the isotopes, so we can place that there as well. So what we're missing now is the percentage abundance. So if we rewrite this equation, what we've actually got looks a little bit like this, where we have the, the abundance just listed as percentages there.
However, we can actually work this out because we know that 100% is the abundance of all the different isotopes. So if we let Y equal the abundance of one of the isotopes, it follows therefore that 100 minus Y will be the abundance of the other isotope. Then if we substitute that into our equation, we have 6.94, which is our relative atomic mass, is equal to the abundance Y times the isotopic mass and the other abundance 100 minus Y times the other atomic isotopic mass. Multiplying this all through, we get something that looks like this, collecting all our Ys on one side, and then we divide it through, and we get the abundance of the lithium-6 isotope will be 7.59%. It is relatively easy, therefore, to work out what the abundance of the lithium-7 isotope is just by subtracting 7.59 from 100. Once the, we have the atomic mass of the various elements, we can use these to calculate the molecular mass. So for example, a water molecule consists of one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. Oxygen has a relative atomic mass of 16, hydrogen is one. So when we add these together, we get a molecular mass of 18. Similarly, aluminium can be calculated Oxygen again is 16, we've got three of those present. We have three hydrogens, each of one, and an aluminium of 27. So we, when we add those together, we get a molecular mass of 78. Now it's your turn to get a bit of practice. Try these problems from page 59 and 70 of your textbook. If you want some more information, there's a video there that you can also have a look at.